Jenny reminded me, I forgot praise, Army Beat Navy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that's um, an important one. That's <laughs> huge, man. That's like the biggest football game of the year for anyone. So, yeah. I didn't get to watch it. The power was up. Uh, yeah. So we uh, were been kind of looking at how Jesus is not just the door to salvation and sometimes the way we water that word down would be simply getting to go to heaven one day. But he's the door and the vehicle and the vessel and the life of everything that salvation embodies. That all that he created us for, all we desire, he is the, it is his ongoing presence which brings to us these things. Um, Philippians 2, 12 and 13, Carolyn, please. Paul says, therefore, my beloved, he's writing to his brothers and sisters in Christ, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Remember, he's in a prison cell. He can't be with them right now. He's like, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you, both the will and the work for his good pleasure. So he's, 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 he's telling them, your salvation is something that is ongoing. It is something you live in. It's something that you... The fruit of when you are saved. What does that mean? It means God is in you. You are brought back with God. You are united. That's when your eternal life begins. Is that that moment that we call salvation is when salvation has begun. It is now Christ comes back in you and you are now living a new creation. Christ in you and you in Christ living this life in union with God. That's salvation. It's not just someday you get to go to heaven. It's now you are with Christ and Christ with you for all eternity. And no created thing, no power, no principality, no act of man or the devil can separate you from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. It is this continual, abiding, living relationship that is made possible. And otherwise, it would be work out your own salvation. It would be you were saved. Now, you know, whatever it's... He's doing that in John 10, 9 to 10. You'll have that, Carolyn. Bring that up, please. Thank you. Uh, Jesus speaks to them. Oh, you don't have John 10, 9 to 10? Yeah. All right, thanks. <laughs> I am the door, so that's what we've been studying. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So remember, anything that is not of God in your life, the enemy has placed there, even if it seems good, the real motive behind it is to steal, kill, and destroy. That is how he lures you in, you know, to things, to something that might seem good or innocent or whatever, until, you know, the example I've used so many times, you know, that our fishing people invest all this money, you know, I remember I go out fishing with Rich and, He's always got, well, this likes this bait, this likes this bait, this is a top water, and this is a deep water, and this is a this, is this. Instead of just, you put a hook in the water. It's no, you try and figure out where are the fish, what are they biting, you know, what's the water temperature, what's the lighting conditions, and how can you lure that fish in, not for its benefit, you're not offering it vitamins. So it will bite and take the hook, and once it's barbed, then you pull it out of the water and kill it. And this is the way the devil works. But he says, I have come. Now. What's that? <laughs> what did he say? Wait a minute now. <laughs> I came that they may have life. He's walking out the door to go fishing. <laughs> that they may have life and have it abundantly. He came that we might have life the way he means it. Abundantly. A life. And, and we started looking over past weeks at some of the different things that I'm just giving you a quick list that we've already covered that are found in this life now in and through a relationship with Christ. He offers us His joy. He offers us His peace. He offers us freedom from anxiety. He says His yoke is easy. His burden is light. He will give us rest. He said between Him and the Holy Spirit, He is the, the bread of life. It is the living water. Come to Him. Believe in Him. Don't quench Him or grieve. We will never thirst. We will never hunger. The water, living water will bubble in us and flow out of us to others. Our sufficiency 
is in Christ. Our identity is in Christ. The provision for our calling, whatever we're called to be and do, is found in Christ. The key to being content in all things is in Christ. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And there is no temptation that is too great that we cannot say no to in Christ. These are just some of the things that He gives us in a living now relationship with Him. As we abide in Him, we don't quench or grieve His Spirit, His life in us. And these are all part of this life that is promised. He is so much more than just the door to get saved from hell. He is the door and the vessel to now. Uh, John 8, 12. Uh, now you can do that one, Carol. Jesus spoke, let's look at a few others. He spoke that I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk, walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So he is the key to not walking in darkness. And he's not talking about the light in the sky or the light bulbs, a thousand LED lumen headlamps. He's talking about the light of our spirit, the true path, true life. And what is this, whoever follows me, not whoever said a prayer one day, whoever follows me, that is an ongoing, living relationship. It is something that is happening continually. Uh, remember we talked about, I am the shepherd. Whoever goes in through the door, whoever comes out and follows me, I will lead the pasture. I will lead. He leads me beside still waters. To lead, to follow, this is ongoing, present, continual. And it's something we have to guard against. You know, it's something that we have to be careful about because there's always a temptation to drift, always a temptation to stop on the path, get off on the path, to look at where he's leading and thinking, oh, I can do it easier, you know. Um, and yet, again, we have that Philippians, the one that Carolyn brought up earlier, it is him who works in us, both to will and to do his good pleasure. This, I, I was reading the book and it said that walking with God is one of the most common metaphors for life with God found in the Bible. Now, I didn't go through and start counting that, so I can't verify that, but it sounds pretty right to me. Um, look at Galatians 5.25. Carolyn has that. For if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Other translations say keep in step with the Spirit, which is a beautiful uh, analogy if it's, you know, because to keep in step with, you, you, um, You've got to be in sync with. You know, it's kind of like that yoking together. You know, you're yoked to, and they got to walk together. And and when you're out of step, it all gets all miscombobulated. Just ask Mary Ann trying to dance with me. It's you know, we try to do the two step or whatever. I mean, it's you know, it's, it's, we laugh at our wedding, opening wedding song, the two step. You look really close in the video, you see her tapping the beat on my shoulder <laughs> because I can't. I can either do the beat or I can spin. If I do both, it's all over. It's, you know, I don't, I don't walk, I don't pick up the beat well, and you know, it's, it's funny. I just make you guys laugh. Some of you heard the story before at West Point, when he used to do marks, and his big giant great six foot drum, and they just go boom, boom, and the guy would be marching us along and calling cadence, and all of a sudden he'd stop and he'd start going left, left. <laughs> this is for cadet. Reinstead, left. Okay. And that'll last 30 seconds. <laughs> but when you're not in step, it throws everything off. And you know, when you do your parades or whatever, else, think it back. Anyway, sorry. Um, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. To walk by the power in step with God's life in us. Don't grieve it, quench it. Um, but to want to follow, to want to do that, we have to know, is God good? Are we loved? Are we accepted? Does He care? Is He capable? These are all things, I mean, who's going to want to follow someone that you don't believe those things about? And I think that's possibly why God doesn't just say, believe I exist, even the demons do that. But I want you to know and believe things about my character, my nature. 
Hebrews 11.6, you have that, Carolyn. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and, this is the character part, that he rewards those who seek him. So there's the existence, but also the character and the nature portion. I think that's why Romans uh, 1, 19 and 20, uh, you have that also, Carolyn, I believe. What can be known about God? He's talking about people that have rejected God and why they, he's not going to, you know, he's cut them loose. It's plain about them. God has shown it that from his in invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and things that have been made. So they are without excuse. It's not just his existence is evidence in creation, but it's his divine nature, his character. I talked some about this last week, how when we went on our trip a year ago in the fall, and we would find these amazing wildflowers or intricate rock formations or stunning little lizards and caterpillars in the middle of nowhere. My guess is no human being had ever seen them and probably wouldn't again before they died. But yet God put the same attention and detail and creativity and uniqueness into those that he does to the most visible things along the closest trails in the national park that get thousands and thousands of visitors a week in the summer. God is not in it for the appearance or performance. You know, it's not just doing it what people see and then just blowing off what they don't. He is creative and unique in his attention to detail, his love, his caring, his kindness, his goodness, his evidence, his nature. We've got to know and believe these things about God. Just like we have to believe God is happy. You know, for some people it doesn't work to say God's like a father because their father always had his approval had to be earned, he was grumpy, angry, mean, whatever. And so you've got to replace that and say, okay, but look at Jesus. He was anointed with the oil of gladness beyond all his companions. Yes, a man acquainted with sorrow to carry our sin, but a man of joy. It is his desire that our joy would be in him, that that his joy would be in us, that our joy would be full. His joy is such that it would fill us if we truly let it flow in us, if we chose it. And so we want to we want to make sure we understand these things, that God loves us, that God has a purpose for us, that the surrender into God's life, letting his life live in us, is good. It's what we were made for. It's how we find our purpose. It's how we find all these things I listed at the beginning, the recap. They're all found in a living and abiding relationship with Him. Who follows me will not walk in darkness. This ongoing present, keeping in step with, walking with God, walking together. This is the joy of Christmas. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, right? We just sang it. What does it mean? It means God is with us. That's the what Christmas is all about. And see, this is what we've got to get. He, yes, He came to save the world. God so loved the world, He said, it's only God's Son, whosoever would believe in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Not just in heaven one day, but your life begins when you go from death to life at the moment you receive Christ's life into you. You are made like alive, new, a new creation, eternally alive. When this old body, this old tent gives out, nothing changes for you except your location. You just step through one door into another into the fullness and presence and face of God. But your life is ongoing life. But we've got to surrender. We've got to say, here I am, Lord. Discover what you made me to be, and that's to walk with you. When the church was up at Dry Bones, there was a poem I just adopted. It so embodied our fellowship. A lot of people were coming through the door broken and just... Um, and I used to put this on the back of a lot of stuff I would do for the church. It's the touch of the master's hand. I have it in some comments called The Old Violin by Myra Brooks Welch. I'm not... I haven't read it enough times recently to get the cadence of it, so I'm going to more read it and poem it, but... Um, I just invented a word. Uh, Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while. 
to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks, he cried, who will start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, then two, only two? Two dollars, who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three, but no. From the room far back, the gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loosened strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as a caroling angel sings. The music ceased and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars? Who'll make it two? Two thousand, who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some of them cried, we do not quite understand. What changed its worth, swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune, and battered and scarred with sin, is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once and going twice. He's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. That's a picture for all of us of what happens when we put our life into the master's hand what he stands ready to do in our life, with us, through us. So we might be battered and scarred. We might even think we're doing well. But really, we're like that old violin sitting alone on the shelf until we lay into the master's hand and then what we really were created to be and do. And what is really available for us in Christ is when it comes out. The joy, the infectious joy peace, the ability to be around people that hurt you, hard to be around and still love, to not respond, to not take it personal, to be filled with grace and mercy and be that one that carries it through the dark times into the light on the other side, to say no to brokenness and addiction, to turn the tide on depression, to find meaning, purpose, identity, hope, security. It is all found in the Master's hand. In His life, our life laid down in His. And that's what we were saved for. That's what Christmas is all about. He says to imitate me. You will find that you have reached who you were created to be and the fullness and the meaning and the joy of that as you reflect the image of God. It says in the Bible that Jesus, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It said, I think it's in Hebrews, but don't quote me, he was the express image of the Father. And elsewhere it says he was the imprint of the Father's nature. Now we all know Jesus was the perfect human. He surrendered his rights as God. He lived exactly like, like we do, subject to all temptation, but empowered and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, exactly what we are called to do. And he showed us what a perfect life would look like. And a perfect life looks like man restored to the image of God. That is when you will find the closer you are living to the image of God, the closer you will find the meaning, the purpose, the hope, the joy, people coming to you and people hating you, people loving you and finding new life and hope, and people casting stones at you and persecuting you just like they did God. You'll find the fullness of the power to say no and stand against darkness. You will find everything you are created to be as you bear the image of God. But see, the amazing thing is God does not ask you to do that on your own strength. No, His yoke is easy, His burden is light. He's not putting one more ought to, one more way I fail on you, one more impossible. He says, no, it is me who is at work in you, both to will and to do my good pleasure. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, 
Let my joy be in you that your joy might be filled. Let my peace be in you that you might have peace in the world. Does that sound like a God who's trying to lay burdens on you and guilt? No. This is a God who invites you to walk and let his life live in you that you might find the joy and the freedom that you were created to walk in. He is with you. He is Emmanuel. And if he's asked you to do something, he's going to be in you bringing it to pass. It doesn't mean we don't work, we don't labor, it doesn't mean we don't find moments that are uncomfortable and hard. But if God is with you, who can be against you? And how many times do we read in the Bible, do not be afraid. Not just in a vacuum, right? It's not just do not be afraid. One more commandment, I'm afraid. Why? It's why. Do not be afraid. Why? Why? Anyone, shout it out. Come on! Really? There you go. Thank you. Yes, do not be afraid because I will be with you. Do not be afraid because I am with you. It's not just don't be afraid. Come on, cowboy up. Rodeo up. Get back on that horse. Quit being a sissy. No, it's don't be afraid. I am with you. The door, the path. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, for just a moment, I'm going to have you bring up John 15, 1, and then we'll come back to this one. I am the true vine. This is how he begins it. So there's a lot of places we can plug in, but I am the true vine. I am the true door. Any other entrance is a robber. I am the way, the light, the truth. Okay. You want to go back, please? John 15, 5. So I am the true vine. You are the branches. I mean, talk about a statement of our life now, not just heaven someday. Whoever abides in me, whoever dwells in me, whoever remains in me, Whoever rests in me, whoever lays back in me, whoever I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And I've talked, I beat this drum a hundred times. We, we all know people that don't know Christ, that run themselves frantic and do things all the time, and build skyscrapers and whatever, whatever. But he said, no, and that which matters, that which carries to eternity, that which is true abundant life of who you were made to be, you can do nothing apart from me. Why? Because I created you to live with me. You know? And that's who he is. And that's what we are created for. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I read a quote recently by Rankin Wilborn. It said, sin, if sin is running from God to get control of our lives, and repentance is turning back to God and yielding control to Him. Now I've tried to share this so many times. I think we do such a disservice when we describe sin as just bad things. Because most of us in this room probably don't do a lot of those bad things. We have our moments, right? But, you know, those things. Sin is anything, Romans says, that is not a faith. Well, wait a minute, that's kind of harsh. No, because we, we make sin bad things. No, what is sin? Here's God who says, here's my life to be shared with you. If you want to walk away and do it on your own, that's sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory or the image or the revelation of God. Anything not of faith is sin. What is faith? Surrender into God, living in partnership with God. So, what is sin? Anything that is not in partnership with God. It could be a charity. But if it's not God's life and you know what He's called you to do, it is sin. What? Well, well, that's again harsh. What do you mean? That's the definition. It's what we choose to do apart from God. On our own. And ultimately,
ultimately that's eternal separation from God. It's just saying, I gave you a thousand chances throughout your life to do it with me. I'm not going to suddenly, you know, the last second, dishonor your free will. That's been your choice. I've beckoned you over and over to come into who I made you to be with me. And we start to see sin that way. And we, the other thing I've shared so often, we think of repentance has got this watered down, oh, someone's at the altar sobbing, they're repentant. No, maybe, but not necessarily. It could just be something tugged in emotional heartstring, and they're just, but you know, six days from now, they'll be back to who they were. Repentance might involve tears, but repentance is a changing of direction. It is a coming back to God, a yielding, here's my life, God. So often we'll meet someone, and maybe even ourselves, who's accepted Jesus and really lives like they did a whole lot before that moment. You know, they were baptized as a child and just kind of hold on to that as, of course I'm saved, you know. Um, That whether they're really saved or not is between them and God. You know, and I'll talk a little more about that maybe in a minute, but I don't know how many of you have seen or read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but remember when Lucy walks through the back of that wardrobe and she's feeling the fur coats from now all of a sudden she's feeling pine needles and snow. She steps into Narnia. That wardrobe was not just a door you know, intended that she would just stand there and kind of the rest of her life stand there, kind of one foot of each, looking at the snow, but staying back here in the fur coats. It was intended to step through into a whole new world and a whole new life. And that's salvation. I am the door to a whole new world a whole new life. See, I came into this world at Christmas and died on the cross that you might step into me and I into you. And we would now walk together. I'm still the door. But you're continually in me. But it's like a moving door or whatever. It's just, we're now doing this whole new life together where you were once powerless against the forces of darkness. You now have authority to stand in their face and command them. Where you once were powerless against temptation and sin, you now have my life and power in you. Where you once had no meaning or purpose and were just stumbling through life trying to find something to give you meaning, purpose, identity, security, peace, and joy, I am now your life. And together we have that. You are royalty. You are priests. It's who we are. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. That is, the, that is how Peter describes the saved. To call, to proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You are now children of the king. Brothers and sisters of Christ. The king of kings and lord of lords. You are indwelt by the star breather. He is your high priest, but you are a royal priesthood called unto minister unto God. Wow. That's your calling in life, people, because of Christmas. That's your identity. You know, I, I mentioned, and I don't want to our salvation is secure. This is going to be a slight tangent because I don't want to walk in out the door with something wrong. We're saved. We're saved. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Okay. The question I'm alluding to was someone ever saved in the first place. Was it an emotional experience or a true encounter with the Holy Spirit? And one of the greatest things that I would say is evidence of whether that transaction really happened is whether or not you can rest with sin in your life. 
not saying whether or not you have sin in your life. We will all fall short. There's all places we will walk from God and do it on our own. But are you okay with it? Because I guarantee the Holy Spirit in you is not. And if you have peace in areas of your life where you are separated from God, I would say you have some questions to ask yourself. Not about if you were saved and lost it, but if you were saved. Now we can push those things so low and quench the Spirit so much and grieve the Spirit that we can be saved and sometimes be almost numb to the nudging of the Spirit and still, and I, I, this should probably, I maybe shouldn't even open this can of worms, but it's probably a whole other teaching. But I was reading that same book, this divine disquiet. If it's not there in the areas of your life that are not in alignment with God, something is wrong. Because the Holy Spirit has come to draw you close to Him. I had one of those moments this morning. I, I saw it in my notes. I'm hoping I can recreate it. But I was taking my quiet time this morning, and this book I was reading, Union with God by Rankin Wilborn, and he was saying, he was specifically talking about prayer. Why do we pray? It doesn't always work. It doesn't always, you know, whatever. But he was saying, prayer draws us close to God, and the greatest gift God gives us is Himself. And all of a sudden, my mind took that and started running. And I thought, God wants to give us the greatest good He can give us. God Himself is the greatest good. So it's back here. So if God wants to give us the greatest good He can give us, and the greatest good He can give us is Himself, and the greatest gift he can give us in any situation is something that draws him closer to him. And all of a sudden I started going, whoa. Okay. So if I'm praying for that financial provision, but God knows if I get that, I'm of the type but I'll quit praying and quit depending on Him and quit trusting and just run off on my own. I'm secure. I've got it. The greatest gift you can give me is not giving me without financial provision because it would keep me closer to Him. Because He, His life, Himself, is the greatest gift. He is what I was made for. He is the gift on the tree. Spread nailed. Why? So he could be with us and us with him. And I started thinking about, and I had to move on because I had to go over my notes, but I made a note, i got to go back and revisit this because I just started scratching the surface this morning, but I started thinking the implications if every situation in my life I said, what is the, what, what would happen, what would I ask for, what would happen here that would draw me closer to him? All of a sudden, it started rocking my worldview a little bit. I was kind of going, whoa. But really, if he loves us, why would he withhold the greatest gift for a lesser gift? You know? Please say again. The greatest gift is with him. Yes. And I'm like, hmm. So i got to unpack that one. But I guess what I'm trying to say is if he's in me, and holiness is my life set apart for Him. Everywhere in my life that the Holy Spirit can't invade because I have sin, I have chosen to say, I don't want you in this part of my life. I want to do this on my own. I am being robbed of a chance to be in union with God in that area of my life. I am being robbed of that which would be the greatest gift I could have, which is to be in step with Him. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is not going to settle, be settled in a peace with that, because God loves me too much to say, okay. He's the perfect Father. And therefore, every area of my life that is not in alignment should be an area I'm not okay with. 
There should be an unsettledness, not good. And when I do become okay with that, it shouldn't be something that concerns me. Because he is the door to life. And anything else comes to steal, kill, destroy. And so we really want to make sure that we understand this. And we don't just receive Jesus or heaven someday. We don't try and break the package apart and just take part of it. You know, my, my cordless drill set finally got to the point I had, finally had to replace it so after shopping around for sales all over the place by Black Friday, finally got my new I got, got it to walk this time. You know, I was, but it would be really stupid if I opened the box, right? And I put the drill over there and I put the battery over there. Now, I just really wanted the battery. Or, you know, I just kind of wanted the drill. Because if I put it on my desk, everyone goes, oh, there's a man. It doesn't matter. It has a battery. I'm not really going to use it. I just want to look like a DeWalt guy. You know? But, no, they're made to go together. But we, we want to take the, 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 the heaven thing and leave the rest apart because I kind of don't want to surrender my life to Him because I kind of think I can do it better, I can make myself happier, I don't want to pay the price, but I sure want to make sure I go to heaven. And, oh, my life just melted down. Maybe I will break glass in case of emergency and ask Him to step in now. You know, who, who doesn't in this room, I mean, I know a few of you, young squirts, but how many of us remember 9-11 and how the churches were filled for six to nine months. And by probably two years later, we're back to pre-9-11 standards. How quickly we forget. You know, when Jesus healed the ten lepers, and nine went off and one came back, he said, were there not nine that were, ten that were healed? Where are the other nine coming to get thanks? Just one? And this one's a Samaritan? Luke 2.10, we're going to end with this. And the angel said to them, everyone hear Linus' voice right now? <laughs> Fear not, but be bold. I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. Christmas. If it is not good news of great joy, we are missing what it's all about. Something about that thing. It is about God and man reconciled. I was showing Mary Ann something I've been reading. I think it is a faint wisp in the back of my mind that I may have heard this 20 years ago, but atonement. It comes from the words at one met. We, we, we make atonement like he atoned for our sins. He paid for them. But the root of the core that that is built around is at one met. He reconciled us. He atoned for our sin that we might be reconciled, brought back to one with God. That is what atonement means. At one meant. And those that comes down, the meant being a conditionary thing, the at one being, and I forget it goes Latin or where it goes, but it was, didn't I say it was invented by Tyndale in the 1600s? That was the word that he used to try and translate reconcile, I think. Reconciliation, I believe. That's the word he came up with, at one meant, atonement. That is what Christmas is all about. That we might be made one again with God and live who we are created to be. So in this series, um, which is just wrapped up, believe it or not, we've covered the seven I am statements of Jesus found in John. Which is another reason why these John Gospels are really good to give out. Um, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true body. 
the seven I am statements of Jesus, and we know he's so much more, but I am, not I was, I am present now, alive, living. I am, and these are yours in me, in your life with me. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for this time to share. May our hearts be filled with joy as we reflect on you and what you've done this Christmas. May you overflow us, Lord. May everything else, as amazing and wonderful as all the gifts and the decorations and the fellowship and the food and the Christmas lights are, may they all be icing and sprinkles on top of the main thing. May you be the main, your joy that you are with us and we are one with you. May that be the joy that fills us this Christmas, that overflows to others, and everything else truly just be said. Thank you, Lord. In the message of Jesus, amen. Please do not hear me say that all those other things are bad, but they've got to be second.